So this was carefully crafted by Dr. Shear so that we have plenty of time for questions and answers. And I would encourage you to ask questions that you have. We have two microphones, which when you identify yourself, you'll have a microphone. If for some reason you would prefer not to ask your question publicly, you can jot it down and hand it to Barry or Tina and they'll give it to us and um, we'll respond to it that way. So please, uh, the floor is open if you'd like to ask your questions. And Lori, yes. um, it's, it's, I'm assuming it's okay to ask Stephanie questions as well, right? Sure. <laughs> Absolutely. Okay. We have a shy group. Lori, we got Dr. Cam right here. <clears throat> Hi. I really like to thank you, all three of you and Barry. That is a wonderful, wonderful talk. And I appreciate both the mother as well as the physician. Um, I have three questions. Either one of you can answer, I guess, in a way. Um, it's probably through Dr. Shear. To take the movie theater example, an analogy, my mentor always, whenever we lose a child, used to insist for the parents to come back to the hospital about a month or two months later so that they can actually you know, close the loop in one sense. So I just want to see whether, how you, your reaction, that kind of a, not insisting, but at least encouraging the family to come back to the hospital, meet with the physician, meet with the nurses, meet with everybody, and go over what happened, what, you know, why it happened. That's, maybe I'll wait for the other two after you. Okay, so you want, you want that answer first, yeah. I think that's actually quite an enlightened thing to, I mean, I know that you're a lot younger than me, but, um, <laughs> so, you know, when we were training, actually, just a little vignette, when I, when I was in medical school, I was at Tufts Medical School, and I was, I, I was interested in attachment relationships in my second year of medical school, and so I did a, a um, I did an elective at the Children's Hospital at Tufts, which had a revolutionary new unit called the Family Participation Unit. That was revolutionary, right? And this reminds me, in other words, at that time, which, which wasn't all that long ago, not only did we not have a Valerie Fund, we didn't let parents stay with their children, their two-year-old, three-year-old, four-year-old children in the hospital. It's quite astounding. In any case, this idea of the physicians actually talking with the parents after, you know, after they've had a little time to settle down a little so they can listen and they can hear and they can think about what they want to know, I think is a really, really enlightened and wonderful. I do, I do have a colleague in... Um, in Detroit named Kathleen Meert, who has been studying parents who lost their children in um, pediatric ICUs. And this is one of her big issues is that, I mean, she's, she's developing a sort of protocol to help people do exactly this. So thank you very much. Yes, I think that's a wonderful idea. I don't want to take the entire thing. Can I ask my other two questions? <laughs> um, do you feel that if we can intervene or, or introduce the therapy maybe not as intense as you're doing when it is more complicated grief, can we abort the complicated grief at that point? You know, in other words, early intervention. I, w I would kind of like to hear Stephanie's response to this too, but I mean, my own feeling is that I, I really, really, really wish that it would be the case. And we don't know. Um, I, I did do the presentation today to try to raise that possibility in a way, because I do think that if you follow these principles, whether you know that that it really can be very very helpful. And people just you know again, it's kind of knowledge. It's understanding what's happening to you. And and you know there isn't a, enough talk about it. I think there's not enough in our field. There's not enough public talk about it. And that's really what the Center for Complicated Grief is all about. So what do you think? Actually, before you answer, Stephanie, there, I want to say that people have, though, told me that they, you know, sometimes when they come, they say, well, you know, in a way I wish that I could have met you five years ago or however long it was, 
But then they say, but you know what? I don't think I would have been able to do it. I don't think I would have been, I wasn't in a place where I could have even acknowledged what I can acknowledge today. So that's where I'm not sure because this process, when it goes off track, I'm not sure how simple it is to get it back on track early on. Um, I don't think I could have done it that much earlier than four years, maybe a year, maybe at, at three years. Um, but I do think that there can be some interventions. I mean, I think I was avoiding so many things for a very long time. I thought that was a way to take care of myself. And it might have been early on and a good way for maybe a year. But after a while, you know, avoiding the supermarkets and not going, driving past the baseball fields, those things are not really that helpful. And it makes your life complicated and difficult. And I spent a lot of time trying to think of ways to avoid the things that were my normal life. So it was really, you know, very difficult. Nobody's asking, I'll ask it to my third, third and last question. <laughs> Um, in our field, as you know, um, fortunately over the last 40 years, the success rate has increased significantly. More children are surviving. It's 80% cure rate. It's a good thing. Unfortunately, even if it's 90%, losing even one child is, is really horrible. Most of the time when the child relapses and, and goes through a bone marrow transplant, what have you, like her child, uh, Eric did, there is a, in one sense, the time is a prolonged grief even before it happens. On the other hand, the child is doing well, in remission, everything. Unfortunately, sometimes we do lose children for complications, totally unrelated to the primary diagnosis at all. That is very stressful, not only the family, but the medical people, the entire staff. My question really is both the grief and the anger. Anger, I can understandable anger from the family towards the medical side, did you miss something? And the same thing for the medical side people to worry about if we miss something. How that grief is anything more intense? In, in, in other words, those are the kind of situations, they make them to go to complicated grief much more. Yes. I mean, I think that's, that's such a good point also. I mean, I, well, and we can be generalized to the fact that any time there's anything about the circumstances of the death that is troubling, okay? And there, there are many different ways that can happen. That becomes a possible kind of focus for the person. That said though, what's interesting is that the best data we have, and we, we don't have great data, but we, I think this is probably true. It about doubles that 7% rate. Remember Stephanie said overall on average, um, complicated grief occurs in around seven, so our best estimate. So we're getting up, it maybe even triples it, 14, 21%. But we still have, it, what's amazing is even under those circumstances, 80% of the, of people, and I, I think here we're talking about the adaptive unconscious again. And also the, the, the ability for a, um, for, the optimal support. I think not everyone has the ability for optimal support, but when you do and when you have, when the adaptive unconscious can work, we can adapt. Okay. So, should I read this or? It's okay to read it? Yes. Okay. I'm a Holocaust survivor. I was in an orphanage. Um, we were put into a dark room when the Gestapo came. I felt alone. My family never returned. Um, um, I'm sorry, it says you can be in a crowded room and feel, I think, alone. You can be, so as a consequence of that, you can be in a crowded room and feel alone. Well, and of course, this is a, this is a very, very, very terrible experience, and it is a trauma as well as terrible loss, and we know that the two together are, can be extremely difficult, and 
at the same time, I would say to this person and to anyone in this kind of situation that there are now people working with people who have survived all kinds of trauma and loss, and that there, you know, I, I think it maybe, um, I wouldn't say, well, so we know that these experiences do change us, so we are going to be changed, but um, I hope that there, whoever this is, would not give up hope. Uh, can I just ask, do you have access to those resources? So if this person wanted to contact us at the Valerie Fund, we could perhaps we will help share you. that? Okay. Yes, we will, absolutely. Okay. Um. Hi. So I, I, you've talked about the different, the acute, integrated, and complicated. Right. Who decides the time period between acute and integrated when you said you want to get on with your normal life, going to the grocery store? Who, who decides when, when enough time has elapsed that right. one should be able to do that? Well, it's not, it's not exactly one should be able to, and, and I guess that's, of course, you, you know that this is, a, this, is, this is a kind of sticking point that people point to. Um, and we don't know, the way that we're going to eventually answer that sort of for the field at large is going to be through having specific criteria, which we, we, we do, we use specific criteria that are very reliable, but there isn't yet consensus in the field exactly what they are, and then we need an epidemiologic study, and then we need to see how this actually unfolds. That said, though, I would say that it's, it's a good rule of thumb to say that when the person themselves feels like their grief is just really, in a sense, stuck, when people around them are feeling that way, it's time to seek help. So the, the data that we have to date suggests that if the inventory of complicated grief, that's a, that's a 19 item rating scale, if, if people score over 30 on that, that little questionnaire, as early as six months after a loss, they're very likely to still be scoring that at 18 months and 24 months later. So there are people who have suggested that six months is the time when we should begin identifying people. And that definitely doesn't mean that everyone who's grieving at six months is in need of treatment. But it does give you a kind of a benchmark that if things are just not moving at all, to at least think about it. So this is a question that remains open. The, the um, DSM-5, the Psychiatric Diagnostic System has included this diagnosis in its what's called Section 3, which is disorders that have a lot of support but are still in need of more research to decide on the absolute specific criteria. And they chose for their provisional criteria a one-year time point. The um, ICD-11, that's the International Diagnostic System, has made a proposal for this condition, and they chose six months as the time point. So it's somewhere in that range is when we, and, and again, I want to emphasize that we're not, we're not saying you should be doing this or you should be doing that, but rather that this whole constellation is or isn't present. So you, we're also looking for the complications. Remember, we're looking for people who are very much preoccupied with some kind of troubling aspect of the death or who are avoiding, as Stephanie was, almost everything in her life. So we're, we're not looking for somebody who's struggling to do one thing or another. And as far as going back to your life the way it was, nobody ever does that. So that's not what we're looking for either. Dr. Shear, before I give the, the mic to Stacy Springer, who has a question for you. Stacy was a longtime social worker at our Valerie Fund Center at Newark and is now doing the same in the Washington, D.C. area. I just want to introduce you and, the, and, and everyone who wonderfully came out tonight to Dr. Perry Kamalaker, 
who's our medical director at the Valerie Fund Center at Newark Beth Israel, who had the plethora of questions because he, <laughs> he may well have treated more children with cancer and blood disorders in the state of New Jersey than anyone else. And so that was Dr. Cam, and this is Stacy Springer. Thank you. I think my question is to Stephanie. Um, after 32 years of working with these kids, I believe that you, as a parent, are our teachers. And I can read all the journal articles I want, but what I truly get is what you teach me. So the question I have is, should we as providers be creating the environment earlier on to talk about it, rather than waiting to the reality of some of the kids will die and we only bring it up when they are actively dying or they have died already. So would it have been more helpful to you if we just created the environment to talk about grief or loss when your son was diagnosed? Well, it's interesting that you asked that because um, I don't remember who called me a couple of years after actually Eric died. They wanted to know about my Valerie Fund experience, which was unbelievable. And um, I had a wonderful, we had wonderful doctors actually when I didn't want Eric to be in hospice um, and I wanted him to stay home, the doctor would come to our home on her way home at the end of the day to check on Eric. And I only had to have hospice for four days before he died. So, um, but that was the one thing that I thought that was lacking with the Valerie Fund was the um, educational and talking about the grief. So I think that maybe the answer is yes, that it should be something that should be talked about. However, I don't really think anything really would have truly, as I said in my speech, prepared me for Eric's loss. Um, but maybe I could have spoken to Lauren, my daughter, Lauren. You know, she was just 18 months younger than Eric. Um, and they really never addressed, you know, it was mainly, they never addressed it. And um, this is one really wonderful story. Um, a couple of years after Eric died, I think that the doctor, Eric's main doctor, oncologist, knew that I was really struggling. And I was very devoted to Eric. I mean, I didn't leave him practically ever. And I was either my husband or I, or my sister-in-law or my brother-in-law. I mean, they were just, Eric was never alone, ever. Um, Actually, my nephew was scared one day, and he was left to watch Eric while we sent our kids off to sleepaway camp the year in June that Eric got home from transplant. Um, but uh, she asked me to go with her for chemotherapy, the doctor. Many years, she wasn't working at the Valerie Fund anymore. And I was a little surprised when she called me. And we were sitting... And I, did sit, and I went with her, went back to St. Barnabas to sit with her. And I asked her, you know, nicely, you know, why'd you ask me? And she said to me, you were so attentive to your son. And you did everything for him. And I just thought that you'd be a really comforting person to sit here with for four hours. So the bottom line is I think that we had to talk about all these things and we can't avoid them. And that would really be helpful. And that's what Dr. Shear really helped me to do, stop avoiding a lot of the things that I was avoiding. Um, and as I said, I think it's really hard to talk about grief. And I didn't know how to do it before I lost Eric. So I really think it's something that everybody should learn a little bit more about. And, and my daughter is very sensitive. And she can talk about it because she lost her brother. And she's the first one to contact somebody if they've lost a grandparent or a parent or something. But it's not so easy for the other people. You know, she's 21 years old, other 21 year olds. My question is about practitioners. Are there people who are trained in your method locally that are available to help, help us? That's exactly what we're trying to do is to get people trained. That's what the Center for Complicated Grief is about, yeah. But right this minute, I'm afraid the answer is no. But there are, I think, some very good grief counselors and what I, you know what we're hoping is that just the principals can help so hi uh, 
this was really very helpful for me. I'm actually going through a very recent loss and I'm getting a lot of value out of sort of seeing the anatomy of this, you know. I'm wondering um, like what your recommendation is for how people who want to support those who have lost people, um, maybe either uh, like how to have the conversation if you see somebody struggling about getting help if they haven't pursued it on their own. So I'm going to I'm going to ask Stephanie if she would like to answer that or if, do you want to So actually I have a friend of mine that actually um, sort of told me that I needed help at this point and I think that people are are fearful of saying that but honestly if nobody told me I probably never would have known because I didn't think that I could ever feel better so if you just share it with somebody I think that ultimately you're, you're doing them the biggest favor that you can do. And, you know, if they're upset with you, I got upset with a lot of people during, you know, the time. I, you know, I was angry, I was sad, and um, shocked still. But I think that there are certain things that you can say, and I think that that's the beauty of what support groups can do also for people, that they can help them recognize if they're not progressing the way that other people, not in the same time frame, but you know, I, I facilitate support groups and I think that some of the parents there saw different things and then they were able to either find additional help or you know, if they decided that they wanted to keep coming back to support groups and that was good for them, you know what, that's really terrific also. Do your studies um, show whether there's any certain types of people that are predisposed to this complicated grief, whether it's themselves or you had the list of the 10 most prevalent deaths, if they fall in those, any of those categories, or if it was their relationship with the person or anything of that sort. Right, and um, that's a very, very important question and we, Again, we can really only say that through epidemiologic studies where we can compare people who do and don't get complicated grief. But that said, we get hints from the clinical work and we do have some idea about who might be vulnerable. And actually, um, one of the important things about that is that it, you aren't vulnerable as a person, you're vulnerable with respect to a specific death. So exactly as you said, um, well, there are person factors that can increase risk, but we, in, you know, we often see people who've had multiple losses, and sometimes they've had another episode of complicated grief around some other loss, but many times they've had other losses that, that were close people, but they didn't develop complicated grief. So there are person, we call them person-related factors, and, they, and that seems to be, the main ones seem to be a prior history of mood or anxiety disorders. If someone has a, a lifetime history of mood or anxiety disorders, it, it does actually, we already know it affects the way that we tend to think when, when something stressful happens, and that's probably, you know, kind of sends us off in one of those tracks. Or people who've had really difficult early upbringing, and that might be actual abuse or neglect, but it also might be just a really, what we call insecure attachment, not a good, solid, loving relationship, supportive relationship with our primary caregivers. And, you know, people don't always have trouble with relationships forevermore afterwards. And sometimes, um, sometimes a person with that kind of history can then find someone in their life that they have a very positive and rewarding relationship with and it's really that combination of having, losing someone that, with whom you're very close and where you have an ex, a, just a wonderful relationship in a context where maybe other, especially your early relationships, weren't so good. So, that, so almost everyone who has complicated grief has lost someone who is very, very important to them. Actually, sometimes we call it an identity-defining relationship. And usually that relationship is very strong and positive. There's a, you know, mental health professionals all, often talk about ambivalent relationships predisposing to problems with grief, but actually that's not what we've seen mostly. We all, we've almost never seen that. We, we've seen it occasionally, but mostly 
it's people who have lost someone who's just been very, very, very important and special. And often their relationship's been even better than most other people's that they know. Then the issue around the circumstances of the death, we talked about that a couple minutes ago, things that are very troubling about the circumstances of the death. So along in that list, um, certainly suicide, homicide wasn't in that list, but that would be another one. Um, accidental deaths often are especially hard because you can imagine them going, it's, when, when you can really easily imagine another pathway, it can be especially difficult. Okay. Well, thank you both uh, very much. Uh, Dr. Harris, we start by asking, could you repeat what the uh, rabbi's book that you recommended was? I didn't get that down. That was um, The Gift of Grief. It's called The Gift of Grief. It's a kind of odd title because <laughs> Thank you. And, and I had a question for Stephanie. In, when in this process, Stephanie, did you, and I had a couple of losses of people close to me last year, when did you start looking forward to stuff with anticipation? And, you know, is there, is there, sometime when you stop looking backward and you start looking forward to vacations or other things that you generally liked before the same sort of anticipation that, that you had, so. If I, if I think that you're asking, I wasn't able to do that until I started therapy with Dr. Shear. There wasn't really anything that really brought me any joy or satisfaction. And actually, one of the things that she has you do um, after at the end of the session, she suggests that you do something that you might enjoy it can be a little thing, and I, I think I sort of like looked at her and said, what are you talking about? I don't really enjoy anything. I'm like, like, I'm like a, I was like a robot. But uh, six weeks after um, I started my treatment with her, I started to be able to look to the future and think you know, of things that I could enjoy and could be excited about. Hi, Stephanie. I'm so honored to be here, and your pain was gut-wrenching for me. I, I, can, I didn't look to my left or right. I can only imagine how everybody felt, because, yeah, we can't imagine, but when you said that Eric climbed into the bed with you, it was just really hard to hear. And when I look at you, I think about your loss, but now I feel that you're okay. You're okay, and you're loved, and and there is going to be more joy through your loss. And I just wanted to thank everyone up here. It's it's been an unbelievable evening. Thank you. Do you have any luck with young people, with siblings? We don't work with them. You don't work with siblings. And, and so there's no, there's no data on complicated sibling grief. Um, my work has been with adults and not children, but there are people in, in the country doing work with children and there have been there have there there are um, actually I'm starting to work with a group out at Stanford under the leadership of someone named Victor Carrion who's starting to do some of this there um, uh, Bob Pinus in also in California someone in Michigan someone in Pittsburgh there are people working with child loss academically that we're talking about now there are lots of people in the community, I think, working with children also. So if there's anybody else who has a question now, raise your hand high so we can, can honor that. Um, it looks like we've answered all the questions. So, um, oh, we have not. Dr. Cam. <laughs> uh, the question is really, 
all our centers, all the value centers have social workers, and now I think uh, all of us actually have a psychologist also on our board. Having said that, what you are doing is probably to me a few, several steps ahead. Do you suggest advocate training in our centers, social workers and psychologists, some sort of crash course kind of thing in this methodology so that we can actually, my feeling still is, if we're able to identify, as Stacy said, grief actually starts on the day one when I tell the parents your child has a cancer. After that, they haven't heard a single word I said. So the grief actually starts at that point. So I'm just wondering, is there a special you know, crash course kind of thing for everybody in the, all the value centers that may be helpful? I would be honored to provide such a course. <laughs> and, we'd, and we'd probably be honored to pay for it. So we've got some talking to do. Thank you for bringing that up, Dr. Kim. Um, I want to thank everybody for, oh, one more. So one, one question, which you may get asked, occurred to me, there's, there's a parent who has lost a, a child, uh, sometimes or frequently asked, uh, is there something in my DNA or genetic makeup that contributed to my child getting, uh, becoming terminally ill? Those that they sometimes look inward and feel that somehow they, some some shortcoming in their genetic genetic makeup contributed to the uh, to the terminal illness. And how do you, if that in fact happens, how do you respond to it? Well, I think most parents. I would say I would venture to say every parent asks themselves some variant of that question. I think every parent feels responsible. I didn't talk about a whole aspect of all of this, but we not only have a, an inborn desire to have relationships with close others that I was talking about, but we also have a, a very, um, it's, it's called a biobehavioral motivational system to take care of others, and it's primarily thought to be um, evolutionarily related to parent-child relations. And, and, and certainly, I don't know anyone, I myself, I'm sure if my child were ill, it would be in my thoughts. I think it's in everyone's thoughts. So, so yes, I think and ge the genetic cause is just one of many that could be um, raised, but that's a, that's a kind of nice one for us because what we've learned again recently, more recently what we're learning more and more about is that genetics you know, is only a little piece of any kind of puzzle. So even if there were some genetic predisposition, probably isn't the determining factor anyway. But you know, I think I think the the whole idea of self-blame is really what this raises. And I think you do want to talk to a parent about how natural it is to blame yourself, and also how basically probably not a good idea it is, and you know probably also how it isn't warranted. So thank you, everybody. I'd like to ask, um, there are surveys, just little surveys, if some of you would mind filling them out, just to educate us about how the session was for you, and, and um, it gives us some feedback. Also, there's material on your way out about the Center for Complicated Grief and Dr. Shear's bio. I hope you'll pick that up and learn more. And I really want to thank Stephanie for being so generous and sharing her story because I think it really is an act of generosity. And for Dr. Shear to come be with us tonight and to really educate us about such an incredibly important topic. And thank you all for, for being here with us.